Good afternoon, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about reverse transcription and integration. And we're going to talk about a couple of very different viruses that utilize this pathway. And I want to emphasize well, the two viruses, retroviruses and hep hepatitis B viruses, all right? So those two viruses have very different genomes, as you will see. They both have reverse transcriptase, but not both of them integrate. Only the retroviruses integrate their genome into the host cell. It's a really important difference I want you to remember. There are a couple of main differences between these two virus families I want you to remember. They were on the exam last year. A lot of people didn't get it, so I feel I didn't teach it well enough. So I'm going to make sure I emphasize it this year. And so retroviruses and hepatitis B viruses, those are the main viruses we're going to talk about. A, a few others scattered in at the end. These viruses probably had uh, common precursors during evolution, and I, I hope to point that out in their life cycles today. So this is a really interesting way of expressing genetic information, as you will see. First, let's go back to when these viruses were discovered. The retroviruses first. Chicken leukemia virus, 1908. So this is way at the beginning of virology history. Remember, it, was, it wasn't until uh, just at the end of the 1800s that viruses were discovered. So this was pretty early on. El Bang and Ellerman found a virus, a filtrable agent, which was a virus that caused leukemia uh, in chickens. And then a couple of years later, Peyton Rouse, right here in New York City at the Rockefeller Institute, as it was called back then, discovered Rouse sarcoma virus. And he got the Nobel Prize 55 years later the longest incubation period for any Nobel Prize. He was a very patient man. Uh, these viruses ended up being called tumor viruses because that's what they did. They caused tumors. Even though at the time people didn't look at, as, at leukemia as a tumor, eventually we realized that that's what it was. Tumor viruses. Eventually they were found to have RNA genomes. This took a while because you remember that we weren't cognizant of RNA as genetic material until the 50s. It really was first discovered uh, with tobacco mosaic virus, RNA genome. So then the question was, how do these viruses transform cells? Now, we have a separate lecture on transformation and what that is. And that's, that's really interesting in its own right. Suffice it to say for today's discussion, these RNA tumor viruses were found to transform cells. That is, if you infected cells in culture, you transform their properties, their morphology, their growth rates, many other aspects of their uh, biology. So we, it was called transformation. And uh, the fact that these had an RNA genome was very puzzling. How could something with an RNA genome transform cells because you have to modify the cell permanently which means you probably do something to the DNA you put a piece of DNA in or something like that uh, so it didn't make a lot of sense so people studied these for a long time to try and figure out how that worked in 1970 the major discovery which opened up this entire field by Howard Temin and David Baltimore working independently but with with knowledge of each other they discovered an enzyme in the virions of RNA tumor viruses. So this is a particle associated enzyme which they called reverse transcriptase and five years later they got the Nobel Prize. Probably Peyton Rouse was really annoyed at this that they got it so quickly and he had to wait for 55 years but they all knew each other. So reverse transcriptase uh, is the enzyme that countered the central dogma which of course back in the 50s and 60s was that you had DNA in organisms and they went to RNA and then to protein. That was the flow of genetic information. And the whole retrovirus family, so up until 1970, they weren't called retroviruses, they were RNA tumor viruses. They got their name uh, because of this enzyme and the enzyme was called reverse transcriptase because it reversed the flow of genetic information. So instead of going from DNA to RNA, it went from RNA back to DNA, and then as you'll see, to RNA and then to protein. So this was a really interesting enzyme. So now we can finally fill in 
this Baltimore scheme. We've mentioned this, this uh, group of viruses for a long time, and this is what we're going to talk about today, the retroviruses, which have a plus stranded, single-stranded RNA genome, you know, just like many other viruses, but they do not go through a negative strand RNA intermediate. They go through a negative strand DNA, and eventually a double-stranded DNA to get to mRNA. So we'll spend a lot of time talking about this uh, group of viruses. We're also going to talk about hepatitis B virus because it turns out that even though these viruses have a DNA genome, they have a reverse transcriptase. Who would have guessed that? So we'll see where that plays in. All right, back to retroviruses. Uh, Baltimore and Temin. Here's Howard Temin, University of Wisconsin, Madison. Anybody from Wisconsin here? No? Amazing. Uh, it's, uh, he, he spent his career there um, and did, did this amazing discovery. These are the abstracts of um, the two papers that came out in the same issue of Nature. Here's Howard Temin. This is David Baltimore. Uh, he likes to fish. This is a big fish he caught here somewhere in New York Bay, I think. So here are the two abstracts. And uh, we interviewed, actually, David Baltimore on, on TWIV 100, so that's a pretty interesting episode. We also talked about reverse transcription in another episode. So this is very good here. Uh, in, infection of sensitive cells by RNA sarcoma viruses, those are the RNA tumor viruses that we're talking about, requires the synthesis of new DNA uh, different from that synthesized during the S phase of the cell cycle. He goes on to say that uh, production of the virus is sensitive to actinomycin D. So this is a drug that prevents transcription, prevents going from DNA to RNA. So that was important because these viruses have RNA genomes. Uh, and here, the, these are the basic observations essential to the DNA provirus hypothesis. Replication of these tumor viruses takes place through DNA intermediate. So Temin's idea was that these, these viruses must have a DNA intermediate. How else could they transform cells? And he thought that the DNA intermediate probably got integrated into the genome, and that's what transformed them. And Baltimore came from more or less the same uh, data. He talked about actinomycin D inhibiting uh, virus production. And these two uh, papers basically report on the, this enzyme, RNA-dependent DNA polymerase, both the same name, in virions, and they worked with two different tumor viruses. They worked, uh, Temin worked with Rouse sarcoma virus, um, which is with uh, the one that um, Peyton Rouse had identified in, in Baltimore work with a different strain. And you can see they both show that they're in the virions. So this is very important. This enzyme was found in the virions, and that's one of the reasons why they were able to find it easily, because they just purified virus particles and then did an enzyme assay with them. So you didn't have to purify it from infected cells. Now, Temin had a particular insight here that he said the DNA was integrated into the host, and that's what transformed the host, okay? So we're trying to explain how cells become transformed by an RNA tumor virus. And again, you will hear more about transformation uh, later on. But he said the DNA of the virus was integrated into the host. It's made by this enzyme. It became a permanent part of host DNA, and he called this a provirus. So the provirus is the viral DNA integrated into the host cell DNA. That's an important word to remember. We're going to use this over and over again today and in many other lectures. So the enzyme they discovered carried this out. Now, th this whole idea of a viral genome integrating into the host, this wasn't new. The, the phage people had known about this for a long time. So th those who had studied bacteriophages that infect bacteria knew that some of them in fact, integrated their DNA into the host to form what they called lysogens. And here is a picture of bacteriophage lambda, which was one of the uh, earlier models for genetic analysis of viruses. It's one of the tailed phages with an icosahedral head. It has a double-stranded DNA genome. So this is not a retrovirus. It's a DNA virus. The DNA uh, is, is linear inside the head, and when it's injected into the host, it circularizes, and it can replicate, and in some cases, it will integrate into a very specific site in the bacterial genome. So this is the bacterial genome shown here uh, in blue. There's a very specific integration site. The lambda genome integrates into it and becomes a lysogen or a prophage, 
within the, the E. coli genome. And under certain conditions, these bacteria can replicate just fine with this prophage in them. Uh, the condition it excises. So that's where it's very different as you're going to see. As far as we know, retroviral genomes never excise from the host. They always stay stuck within there. Okay? And that is important. If we could excise retroviral genomes from the host cell, we could cure HIV infected individuals. But we can't. We can't figure out how to do that. It happens very easily with phages, but doesn't happen with retroviruses. So Tamman basically took his inspiration from phage. He said, the phage can modify the host. Maybe my retroviruses do as well. So here's, here's a typical retrovirus. These are the kind that uh, Rouse identified, Rouse sarcoma virus and related viruses. On the left is an electron micrograph. So these are roughly spherical particles. Uh, you, they have a, a lipid envelope, and you can see there's a dark core in the middle. This is where the genetic information is. This is, in fact, the capsid. You can't see it very well on here, but there are glycoproteins. So on the right is the schematic. Uh, starting from the outside, the glycoproteins embedded uh, in the membrane. And um, <clears throat> the glycoprotein is composed of two parts called surface and transmembrane. I'll often refer to it just as the viral glycoprotein. We have a lipid envelope. Uh, we have a, a protein, a matrix protein below it, which gives the envelope a little bit of strength and integrity. And then below that is the viral capsid. And that contains the nucleic acid of the virus. Um, this is not an icosahedral capsid. It has some kind of hexagonal symmetry, but it's not, it's not built by icosahedral symmetry. The capsid contains the RNA genome, which is shown in, in green here. The RNA is complex with a protein called nucleocapsid protein. And then there are a variety of other proteins included. There's a protease, a viral protease. Uh, there's an integrase and a reverse transcriptase, all within the capsid. All right, so that's our simple retrovirus. You'll see later HIV is a bit more complex than this. So here's the genetic coding strategy of these viruses, if you will. On the top, we're looking at what we call proviral DNA. So this is the viral genome converted to DNA as it is integrated in the host. And you'll see it's in blue because it's DNA. And there are two what we call long terminal repeats at either end, LTRs. We'll, we'll talk about what they are in a moment. And then you can see all the coding regions for the various viral proteins. So there are proteins here on the left that are used to build the core or the capsid. There are the enzymes in the middle, the reverse transcriptase, and the integrase, which we will talk about in a bit. And then to the right are the proteins that make up the glycoprotein, the envelope glycoprotein, the surface, and the transmembrane parts of that. The way this genome is expressed, it is always expressed when integrated into the host cell DNA. All right, so this proviral DNA, which by definition means integrated, is expressed. It's transcribed in the same way that mRNAs are made, that we talked about last time, by the host cell RNA polymerase II. And uh, RNAs are produced. Here's a, a genomic RNA, which is full length. And this gives rise to uh, structural precursors. It also gives rise to uh, the reverse transcriptase. And then a spliced version of this gives rise to the envelope glycoprotein. So the envelope sequences are encoded here, but they can't be accessed uh, in, in this message. So they're accessed by a spliced uh, mRNA. So it's relatively simple. There aren't too many proteins. Capsid enzymes uh, and envelope glycoproteins. And as I said, the HIV genome is much more complicated than this, as we'll see later. All right, so how do these viruses replicate? Let's talk about the overall scheme. They bind to a receptor. There are many different kinds of retroviruses that we know of now. Um, and we will talk about the human retroviruses that we know of later. They all bind to receptors, and they're all quite different. There are many, many different retrovirus receptors. Uh, the virus uh, is taken up into the cell. Some of them fuse at the, at the cell surface and release the capsid. Some of them come in by endocytosis. Either way, the capsid ends up in the cytoplasm. Okay, so now the membrane's gone. The capsid is there. You can see it's shown in a slightly permeabilized manner here. It seems to loosen up a bit as it comes in. But in that is the genome, the RNA, and all those enzymes and other proteins that we talked about. 
And this begins to synthesize DNA right away, right in the cytoplasm. And eventually it makes a double-stranded DNA, and then it goes into the nucleus. And we'll talk about these steps in a moment. The DNA gets into the nucleus where it integrates into the host cell DNA genome, which is shown right here. So the retroviral DNA is blue, and the host cell DNA is purple. From that position as a provirus, so this is what a provirus is, an integrated copy of the viral DNA in the host cell. If provirus is not this, it's not the RNA, it's this right here specifically. From that position, it is transcribed by host cell Pol2. There's a promoter near the 5' end we'll talk about briefly. You make messenger RNAs. The host cell is making the messenger RNA. And these, of course, are exported. Some of them are exported without splicing to give rise to uh, structural proteins and the reverse transcriptase and integrase. Some of these messenger RNAs are spliced and exported to make the glycoproteins uh, for the, the envelope. And eventually, new genomes, uh, glycoproteins, and structural components are assembled uh, at the membrane, the plasma membrane, and a new particle buds off. We'll talk about this assembly process in more detail in a couple of lectures during assembly. What I find interesting about this is that the virus really doesn't replicate. It doesn't replicate its genome, right? The DNA doesn't replicate. It comes in and makes, it RNA, it makes a DNA copy of the RNA, and then that integrates in the host cell. So there's no real DNA replication, except when the host divides, of course, but the host is doing that. And then uh, the virus makes messenger RNAs. So I don't really consider that replication. Some of these messenger RNAs end up getting into virions. So this is an example where the, the, the cell is doing everything for the virus. With the exception of that reverse transcription, um, the cell is doing, making uh, its DNA when it divides and making mRNAs. <clears throat> now reverse transcriptase is a very interesting enzyme. Let's talk about this a little bit. It's a primer dependent enzyme. Primer can be either DNA or RNA. And the primer has to have a paired 3' hydroxy terminus. So here is a, an example of a, a template. So this, this is typically in the virus and RNA template, of course. Uh, and then we'll see what the primer is in the virion. But this, in, in principle, can be either DNA or RNA. And the 3' hydroxyl has to be free and base paired uh, on the template right here. So that's what that means. The template can also be RNA or DNA. And you'll see where that comes up during the scheme of uh, reverse transcription. Only deoxy NTPs are incorporated, not ribo NTPs. So it makes DNA. No matter what you give it as a primer or template, it makes DNA. And of course, the right deoxy NTP is selected by base pairing uh, with the template. So this is standard nucleic acid synthesis that we've already talked about here, uh, with the exception, of course, that uh, we're making DNA from an RNA uh, template. Now, reverse transcriptase is quite an old enzyme. Once it was found in, um, in retroviruses and tumor viruses, then people started looking for it elsewhere to try and figure out where it had come from. So it turns out that there are some bacteria and archaea that have reverse transcriptase activity. The myxobacteria, E. coli, archaea, you can find RT activity in all of those bacteria. So we think that reverse transcriptase is quite an old enzyme. We think it evolved before the bacteria and the archaea and the eukaryotes separated here. So probably arose long before that, because they all have it. Right? It's a related enzyme, so it probably was in some precursor. It's thought that reverse transcriptase could be the bridge between the RNA world and the DNA world. You remember in the first session, we talked about an ancient RNA world that we think existed where all organisms were RNA-based. And that survived for a while. But you know, RNA is fragile. It's sensitive to nucleases. It can't get very long. You'll see that the biggest RNA viruses we know of, the genome is only about 25 kilobases long, much shorter than DNA genomes. So the idea was that although it worked in this early world, as soon as an enzyme 
arose that could make DNA, then DNA started to predominate. And we think that maybe RT uh, was some enzyme that just arose by mutation from an RNA dependent RNA polymerase, began making DNA genomes, and those thrived because they had a selective advantage. They could get bigger and they were more stable. This, of course, is all speculation, but it, it makes a lot of sense that RT is a very old enzyme. And of course, we had to find a way to, to convert the RNA world to a DNA one. So our, our, RT is quite old. Now, you remember a, a while ago, we looked at the four classes of nucleic acid polymerases. And they're shown here again. This is the same slide that um, we looked at earlier. Um, and these are showing you the RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. Uh, the RNA-dependent DNA polymerases, reverse transcriptase, which we're talking about today, DNA polymerases, and then transcriptases, DNA-dependent RNA polymerases. And I remember I told you that they're all related. They have common motifs in, in, among all of them. These green areas, which correlate with the uh, thumb and the fingers and the palm domain. So RT fits in there as well. You can see it has the same domains, and it has conservation. So probably these enzymes all arose from some common precursor. And these were some signatures for the other polymerases that I told you about. These don't apply uh, to the reverse transcriptases. So reverse transcriptase has the ability to make a DNA copy of RNA. It's a primer dependent enzyme. It copies RNA and can use a primer to make a DNA template. There is a second activity associated with reverse transcriptase that's essential for the retroviral life cycle, uh, and that's RNASH. And this is an enzyme that cleaves RNA, so you can tell by the name, right, it's an RNase, only when it's in a duplex form, and that means double-stranded. It could be RNA-RNA or RNA-DNA. So it will cleave one strand of the duplex, and it cleaves endonucleolytically. It cleaves inside, not at the ends, not an exonuclease. It's an endonuclease. It cleaves on the interior. And it cleaves in this manner. So here is um, just a series of nucleosides linked together in a, in a, in a, a double-stranded molecule. Uh, and each one, of course, is, is linked by a phosphodiester bond, a single phosphate with two oxygens on either side. So one base would be here. The second base is not shown here. Here you can see it right here. So it's a one base, oxygen, phosphate, oxygen. Uh, RNASH cleaves uh, between the phosphate and the five prime terminal oxygen. So it makes short oligonucleotides with a five prime phosphate and a three prime hydroxyl. Uh, this enzyme basically is degrading the RNA as, it, as the enzyme is making a DNA copy of it. And we'll see how this happens uh, in a moment. So that's RNase H. <clears throat> we do have structures at uh, high resolution of many reverse transcriptases. This happens to be the reverse transcriptase of HIV-1 at the top here. And you can see it has the motifs of a typical nucleic acid polymerase. It has a palm domain, and that's where the active site is. It has a fingers domain, a, a thumb. So it, again, looks like a right hand, as do the other uh, polymerases. And this uh, structure, which was actually solved with a bit of uh, primer template in it, you can see that the, uh, the nucleic acid lays across the palm. Here's the active site here uh, with an incoming deoxy-NTP. So we have a template strand, which is being copied, of course, and a primer strand here as well. This cartoon at the bottom here makes it a little clearer. You can see the individual domains. Um, this is the palm or the active site. And remember, the, the classic model for nucleic acid synthesis is the two-metal model. You need two metals that are coordinated by two aspartate residues. You can see them right here. Uh, those are held in place to help coordinate the incoming triphosphate. And here, of course, the template is, is RNA. It's come in through this part of the enzyme. It's flowing across the active site. And then at the active site, DNTPs are added to the growing chain. So the DNA is in blue here. You can see it's moving across the surface of the enzyme coming out here, this side, the opposite side where the RNA came in. And then down here is the RNase H active site. So the RNase H and the RT are part of the same molecule. The RNase H also requires two metals to do its thing. And this is degrading the RNA as it passes the active site. 
So the RNA sage is taking away the RNA. It's not needed anymore. It served its purpose. It's a template for the synthesis of DNA. And that's coming out there. So the DNA synthesis by reverse transcriptases is typically very slow. Uh, four hours to replicate a nine kilobase genome. It's a lot of time, 9,000 nucleotides. And it makes a lot of mistakes. It makes one misincorporation for every 10,000 to a million nucleotides polymerized, polymerized. So about an error per genome per replication cycle. It's quite error prone and it doesn't have a correction mechanism to take away the errors. So this is uh, why, in part, retroviruses are quite variable. <clears throat> now let's take a look at the genome, the viral genome that is in the particle. Uh, again, up on the upper left, there's our retrovirion. And I've been showing it to you with two green molecules in it. And these are two viral genomes, two viral RNAs. So every retrovirus particle has two of them in it. As you can see here, they're both coated with protein, nucleocapsid protein. And uh, there's also reverse transcriptase in them, of course, and integrase and RNA sh This is what the genome looks like. Uh, here's the 5' prime end here. It's capped. 3' prime end is polyadenylated. And it's interesting that this is coated with nucleocapsid protein because most of the plus strand RNA viruses come in naked, remember? They don't have to be coated with anything because they can be translated as soon as they come in the cell. But this is an example of a plus strand RNA genome that's not a message because this is not translated when it comes in the cell. This is going to be reverse transcribed. So it's coated with protein in order to facilitate uh, that step. So the genomes are roughly base paired near the 5' prime end. There is some homology which allows base pairing between the same uh, polarity. I know it sounds weird. This is not plus and minus strands. It's two plus strands, but there is a little bit of base pairing possible. It's not perfect, obviously. Uh, and then, of course, the coding regions are shown here for the various genes, the GAG, the structural proteins, the polymerase, in the envelope glycoproteins. All right, so in the virion, you could say the virions are diploid if you want because they have two copies of the genome. Now also present in the virion are two tRNAs, two transfer RNA molecules. And you'll see what the, the function of those are in a moment. These, of course, are derived from the host cell. They're not encoded by the virus at all. They are taken up during assembly uh, by the virus particle from the cell, from the cellular pools. Now, we think that the genomes are dimers in order to give this virus genetic flexibility. Um, these viruses are pretty resistant to UV and ionizing radiation. Most viruses, depending on the genome size, can be very sensitive to these treatments which damage the, the genome because there's no easy way to fix it. But we think retroviruses have two copies to make them resistant to these kinds of insults, which they will encounter, of course, uh, during their movement within and outside of, of organisms. So they have two copies of every gene. So what we think happens is during reverse transcription, which we'll talk about in a minute, the enzyme is always switching back and forth between one template and the other. It just does so randomly. And so in the end, you increase the chance that you're going to get rid of deleterious mutations. So let's say the genomes have a mixture of mutations caused by UV or ionizing radiation. Uh, when the polymerase just switches back and forth, eventually, by, by chance, it's going, to have, it's going to make a copy that's intact. And of course, that's the only copy that will multiply. It may have some changes in it, but it will be viable. Okay, so that's why we think that they are, these genomes, these viruses have two copies of all genes to make them resistant to these insults. So the mechanism that creates an infectious genome is called copy choice. It's the same mechanism that causes recombination among RNA viruses. Polymerase is copying one strand, and because the two strands are close to each other, it can readily switch to the other. And again, it does so this, it does this probably a lot, very often. It probably goes a few bases and switches back and forth, and it does it randomly. Right, so let's take a look at how reverse transcription works. So at the top, again, is our dimeric genome, two RNA molecules, slightly base paired at the 5' prime end. And let's take a look at just the very 5' prime end where we have this tRNA. 
So this tRNA is actually base paired to the viral RNA. So the tRNA here, uh, it binds to a place called the PBS, the primer binding site. So this is going to serve as a primer for reverse transcription. So it's an RNA primer that's going to prime DNA synthesis by RT. This part of the genome is quite interesting. You'll see there are lots of letters for different motifs. Uh, there are inverted repeated sequences here, IRS, IRL. And there's also a very interesting constellation here called R, U5, and 3 prime. And those will be, the, the importance of those will, will come up in a moment. So here on the, on the bottom is um, the tRNA. Uh, this happens to be a tryptophan encoding tRNA, but uh, different retroviruses enca encapsulate different kinds of tRNAs. And the way this is actually present in the particle is this is base paired to a rather complex structure. So without the tRNA, if you just took the viral RNA, it would fold like this in this region right here. So you can see the primer binding site is right here. We have the U5, IRS, IRL down here. But when you add tRNA, the tRNA melts apart this structure and fits itself in to bind to the primer binding site. All right, so this is basically a stem loop structure. And the middle part has the tRNA base paired very specifically. And there's a free three prime hydroxyl right here. And that's going to be the priming site for reverse transcription. Yeah. Um, so you seem to say before that the choosing of the TRNA is pretty random because they just keep getting whatever is available. But have they found any um, preference, I guess, in the viruses that survive in terms of what TRNAs are present? So the question is whether specific TRNAs are incorporated in, in different retroviruses, or are they random? Okay. So they're not random for sure. Uh, diff different uh, types of retroviruses, like Rouse would have a specific tRNA and HIV would have a different one. But it's always the same. It's not variable within the, the kind of retrovirus. All right, so that's the primer, and it's, it's very specifically bound here. All right, <clears throat> so that primer, that tRNA, this is really neat that the virus is now utilizing a primer for reverse transcription, which is a host tRNA. I think that, that's amazing, and it evolved that way, obviously. So now we're going to go through this scheme of reverse transcription, which I think is really amazing. It's a bit Baroque, but it has a, a means to the end. It it's, it's means is to make a, a proviral DNA, as you will see. So we start out with the viral genome in the capsid. It's, it's dimeric, but we're going to just show one for simplicity. But remember, uh, the enzyme is probably switching back and forth between the two RNAs. It comes in with the virion, with the tRNA, of course, base paired. And look where it is. It's very close to the 5' prime end of the genome, right? So the priming event, whatever, whenever it occurs, doesn't go very far, or so it would seem. So the reverse transcriptase uses the tRNA as a primer and begins to make the negative strand of DNA. So it's a light blue color to show that it's a negative strand, all right? So that is bound covalently to the tRNA primer. And the reverse transcriptase goes, of course, it reaches the end, the 5' prime end of the genome, and can't really go anymore because there's nothing left to copy. As the RT is producing that DNA, it's degrading the other strand, which is RNA, of course. So that's shown by the little uh, pieces there of that green RNA. That little piece of DNA is called negative strong stop DNA. And that's only because when people were studying this, they would run gels of the products, and they would see this small piece of DNA, and they called it minus strand st strong stop, and the name has stuck. It turns out now, in order for this reverse transcription to continue, uh, this sequence base pairs with the very three prime end of the viral RNA. So here's the three prime end. It's a polyadenylated three prime end, and the sequence here is now complementary to that negative strand of DNA. If you look at the original genome, we have R, an R sequence, at both ends, the 5' prime end and at the 3' prime end. And we have a U3 at the 3' prime end and a U5 at the 5' prime end. Those are different. And then, of course, the primer binding site. And so when you make a, a, this strong stop minus DNA, that's going to be complementary to the R because that's a copy 
of the R here. So this actually is going to now prime at the three prime end and continue uh, polymerization. And remember, all this is in the cytoplasm, in the subviral particle. So here now we have that little piece of minus strong stop DNA. It's annealing to the three prime R sequence on the viral genome. That's called a template exchange. That's the first one because there's going to be another one because now the DNA goes from this part of the template to the three prime end. So this, you can imagine that this RNA is all compacted together in a way that would allow these template exchanges to occur easily. It's not going to happen if the ends are very far <laughs> apart. So the reverse transcriptase continues to copy this RNA template, and you can see that's shown here. And as it goes around, it's chewing up the RNA template, except for this little sequence here, the polypurine tract, PPT, which doesn't get degraded by RNA-SH, and that's because it's going to serve as a primer uh, in a moment. Again, we're making minus strand DNA. We're going all around the genome, as you can see here. And while this is still happening, uh, the enzyme begins to prime a plus strand DNA from this polypurine tract. So this can happen because there are multiple enzymes in the particle, and they can carry out different activities. So now we're starting to make a plus strand shown by the darker blue color while the minus strand is still being extended. We still have our tRNA on here. It's hybridized and the initial strand, okay? And now on this panel on the left, the first negative strand has been completed and we've gone all the way to the end of the genome to the primer binding site, which is here. And in the process, the plus strand is being made all the way to the tRNA here. The RNA-SH, of course, is working. It removes uh, this primer right here. And now, so, and it also removes the tRNA. It has an endonuclease activity that does that. So the positive strand extends to a modified base in the tRNA. Then the tRNA is clipped off. So now you have a single-stranded overhang. And guess what? Right, that base pairs with this end of the negative strand DNA. And the enzyme begins to copy in that direction. So this is the second template exchange, if you will. First one was way, way in the beginning when that first negative strand uh, went down to the, uh, to the three prime end. So we've made a full length negative strand. Now we're starting to make the plus strand. Of course, we want to make double stranded DNA. So that's, that's how that is doing. And finally, we start at the, resume at the top here. This is where we were in the last slide. We had a complete negative strand DNA, which was made by copying the RNA with a, with a jump here. And now we're starting to copy back. The primer binding site on the plus strand hybridizes here. Remember, because it's the same sequence on both strands, one is the complement of the other. They can hybridize. So the enzyme then continues to copy this entire negative strand until you have a fully duplex DNA molecule. And this <clears throat> is eventually going to integrate into the host cell. Now let's stretch this out below here just so that we can look at it a little more carefully and see what we've made. Because this is where all of this uh, jumping and digestion comes into play. So here is what's going to be proviral DNA once it's integrated. You can see on the left and the right is what we call an LTR, long terminal repeat. This wasn't present in the viral RNA. This has been generated as a consequence of all of these jumps and polymerizations. We have U3, R, U5. Remember, the U3 sequence was originally present at the three prime end. The U5 was present at the five prime end of the RNA. But look, now it's repeated at both ends. We have U3, R, U5, U3, R, U5. And we have uh, the polypurine site here and the, and the primer binding site here. So we've made now a, a, a genome, a double-stranded DNA genome with an LTR at both ends. And that's why you do the funny business at the ends. That's why you prime very close to the five prime end and make jumps in order to duplicate these sequences. So in the end, it's really not that complicated. It looks tricky with all of these jumps, but it's really the enzyme starting at an end and by, by definition running out of template. So it has to jump to the other strand and go around. And then there, you saw there are a couple of 
uh, RNA primers that prime this process. We end up with this, a double-stranded DNA, which is different from the RNA. All the genes that encode proteins are the same in here, but the key is we have these LTRs. Now remember, what we had here, for example, RU5 and RU3, now we have U3, RU5, U3, RU5 at each end. <clears throat> and this, the next step for this is to integrate into the genome. This is all made in the cytoplasm, this nice double-stranded uh, DNA. And then, and that's shown on the top here, with the two LTRs, the viral DNA is in blue. And this is going to integrate into the host cell DNA. So the target here is our DNA or any animal's DNA. Uh, and the, the integration target is this yellow, this orange bit right here in the middle. The rest of the genome of the host cell is in purple. Once this integrates, and we'll look at the, how this happens in a moment, we now have an integrated or proviral DNA. Remember, the provirus or proviral DNA is the DNA integrated into the host cell. So now you see we have host DNA on either side. Remember this orange part that was the target? This is now duplicated on either side of the provirus. We have one orange sequence here and another one here. The duplication is a feature of the integration pro process, which I'll tell you about in a moment. And when you see duplicated sequences like this, the first thing you should think of is it's a retroviral integration. And in fact, that's how we tell if sequences in our genomes are retroviral or not, by looking for duplicated host sequences on either side. Uh, we also have the two LTRs, which are shown here in green. And then we have the rest of the viral DNA in the middle, proviral DNA. Now, the LTRs are important because in building them into the DNA, what we have done is to build a promoter at the 5' prime end for RNA polymerase II and a termination and polyadenylation sequence at the 3' prime end. So now in this integrated state, host RNA polymerase will come along and say, aha, there's a promoter here. And all those sequences that Dr. Silverstein talked about that regulate transcription, they're all there. And uh, transcription proteins will bind. And the host Paul II will come here and start making mRNAs, pre-mRNAs, either capped, they cover the entire genome, and they're polyadenylated. So again, this is all done by the host cell by the host cell RNA polymerase. And it wouldn't happen if we hadn't generated these LTRs by that Baroque reverse uh, transcription process. So let's look at the integration. Now this is carried out by another viral enzyme called the integrase, which is a separate protein. So, so far we have uh, reverse transcriptase and RNASH1 protein. Now we have integrase, it's a separate one. And what this does is take the DNA, the double-stranded DNA that we have made by reverse transcription and integrates it into the host cell DNA. So here's an outline of the integrase protein in, in black here. And here's retroviral DNA. So the retroviral DNA is shown with its ends adjacent. Uh, the integrase catalyzes the invasion of the host DNA, which is labeled here as target DNA. It's purple. That's our genome or whatever genome of a cell that's going to be integrated by this viral DNA. It catalyzes an attack by the three prime ends of the viral DNA to this double-stranded target DNA. And that breaks the target DNA. It generates two free five prime ends from the target DNA. You can see on the upper right. They are then ligated to the viral DNA by the integrase protein. It is then repaired. So now we have two gaps here, right, between the viral DNA and the host cell DNA. Those are then repaired by the addition of nucleotides and ligated. So now we have a provirus. So you can see by virtue of the fact that uh, we are invading and nicking one strand of the host DNA duplex, and then filling it in, we're duplicating the sequence at either end. That's where the duplication comes from, because you're copying each strand separately uh, to repair this. So those orange target sequences are duplicated precisely by this mechanism. Now, it also turns out that the, in order for this to occur, the viral DNA has to be chewed back a little. So you can see here, the 5 and 3 prime ends are flush. But the integrase chews back uh, one strand 
uh, the plus strand a few bases, and you can see that's why you have an overlapping five prime strand here. So that you lose a couple of bases at the viral ends, and then you duplicate the host cell uh, target sequence. So that's all done by the integrase protein. So this is the, the x-ray crystal structure of the integrase protein. It's a dimer, as shown on the left here. Uh, and the way it interacts with the viral and cellular sequences is shown here. So this is sort of, th on the right is an outline of the x-ray structure shown here. The two dimers are shown in green and, and blue. And so here we have the viral DNA ends laying across the catalytic surface of the integrase. So there are two catalytic cores to dimer. Each monomer has one catalytic site. You need two to accommodate both strands. So here's the viral DNA. That's our three prime end. It's chewed back a couple of bases. We have a, three f a free three prime hydroxyl that then attacks the double-stranded host DNA, which is laying across the enzyme perpendicular to the viral DNA. And this attack occurs from both viral strands. The host DNA is nicked. It's then ligated to the viral DNA, and it's repaired. And that gives you the duplication at the ends. And so that, that's shown up here. So this is all done by the integrase. The reverse transcriptase is finished making a double-stranded DNA. The integrase then comes in with the viral particle into the nucleus and does this and integrates this DNA into the host cell DNA. And that becomes the provirus. <clears throat> so both of these enzymes, reverse transcriptase and integrase, are targets for antivirals used to uh, regulate HIV infection because these are unique enzymes that we don't have in, in, in substantial amounts. Now earlier, a day or two, a lecture or two ago, someone asked about retroviral integration sites. So here's a table that addresses that. This is a, uh, a table where we're looking at retroviral integration site preferences. And so this is a analysis of human cells or mouse cells that were infected with a couple of different retroviruses, ASLV, a mouse. This is an avian retrovirus, a mouse retrovirus, and HIV, of course, human retrovirus. And then the integration sites are mapped. And they're mapped to know whether they are within genes or at transcription start sites. And these are expressed as percentages. So for example, uh, if you just threw DNA randomly into cells and allowed it to integrate, these are the numbers you would expect simply by the numbers of coding regions and transcription start sites within our genome. 26% of the time we'd expect to be within a gene and 5% of the time within a transcription start site. <clears throat> now you can see the numbers are not the same as randomness for these uh, viruses. So ASLV, for example, within genes is slightly higher than randomness, uh, as, as are these other as well. So there's a slight preference for being in a gene. Some of these also seem to prefer being at a transcription uh, start site, but uh, some of the, obviously eight and 10 are not very different from five. So the bottom line is that integration is more or less random. There are no specific integration sites as there is for lambda in its host. The at site in the host DNA is the specific integration site for lambda. There's only one place where lambda can go. These retroviruses will go just about anywhere. They seem to prefer to be within genes and maybe some of them near transcription start sites. Okay, so not completely random, but there, again, there's no specific integration site. Now on the right is an experiment done in mouse cells uh, which, uh, which were infected with HIV. And you can see 62% integrations within genes, six within transcription start sites. So it likes to be within genes and mouse cells, and it doesn't really care if it's uh, within uh, a transcription start site. And then a, a, a mouse cell line was studied which is deficient in a gene encoding this protein, LEGF. LEGF happens to be a protein that's part of the nucleosome in chromatin. And so when you take away uh, this protein, you can see the numbers shift a little. The, the percentage of integration within genes goes down uh, and the start site integration goes up. The suggestion here is that maybe LEDGEF is helping to target um, viral integration to chromatin, which it might want to do. And in general, what we think is that there is some preference for integration into DNAs that are 
wrapped around a nucleosome and which are exposed as opposed to the intervening nucleosomal sequences. So LEDGEF is bound to the nucleosome itself, so maybe this is telling us that HIV likes to uh, integrate there. Once the viral genome is in the cell as a provirus, it's transcribed, as I said. There's a strong promoter in the uh, left LTR, which is built during reverse transcription, as I said. Uh, and that is transcribed by, by host systems. And the viral mRNA then it can be translated, it can be spliced, or it can eventually be incorporated into infectious virus particles. So I like to say there's no DNA replication and there's no RNA replication. All the virus does is to copy its RNA genome into DNA, because really it doesn't have any other enzyme that is amplifying its genome. So that's an overview of this whole process. Again, starting from entry, we have this core, subviral core in the cytoplasm. All of the enzymatic steps that I've shown you for reverse transcription carry out, are carried out in the cytoplasm. Uh, these uh, double-stranded DNAs then go into the nucleus, and the integrase goes with them, and that, of course, makes the integration site into the genome. And then we have transcription, which produces uh, mRNAs for various proteins, as well as new genomes. So the genomes, which are going to get packaged into new virions, they get packaged as dimers again. These are full-length transcripts. In other words, full-length, unspliced transcripts of the provirus. They have a cap and they have a poly A tail. But then once they're in the particle, they're not going to serve as a messenger RNA later on. Now this provirus is a permanent part of you. Um, it gets integrated and as I say, we don't know how to take it out. The virus doesn't want to take it out. It just, the way the virus gets out of the cell that has the provirus is by having the cell make mRNAs and those get packaged into new virus particles. So the only way out of the genome is by transcription. Now when, when the provirus goes into your germline, which it can do, these are called endogenous retroviruses. So you can imagine that if you get infected by a retrovirus, it could just infect skin cells or respiratory cells. It's not much of a consequence. But if it gets integrated into your germline, then you can pass it on uh, to others. And this is why I said initially uh, at the first lecture, 8% of our DNA is retroviral because we have a whole bunch of these endogenous retroviral genomes in our DNA. These are remnants of being infected many, many years ago. <clears throat> and these are called retro elements. These are retrovirus related sequences and as I said, endogenous retroviruses or endogenous proviruses are in the germline as opposed to a somatic cell. The ones we have are replication defective. We don't make any retroviruses because all of our retro elements are defective. They have mutations in them that prevent viruses from being made. But about half of our genome is composed of mobile elements that are related to these retroviral sequences, including endogenous proviruses, but there are other retro elements as well. And this, this table summarizes that. These are different kinds of retro elements that are in us, in our genomes. So for example, endogenous retroviruses, so that's the proviral DNA sitting in our genome. Uh, that's about 8% of our DNA, old infections that happened probably millions of years ago, and these DNAs are still with us. Uh, there's another kind of element called a retro transposon, which is basically the same as an re endogenous retrovirus, but it's missing the envelope uh, glycoprotein. And you can see in all of these diagrams, we have cellular DNA in purple. It's duplicated on either side. Then we can have LTRs, and then some of the viral genes are shown here. About 20% of our genome are, is comprised of what are called line elements. And these, again, are uh, retro elements. They have duplicated host sequences. There's no LTRs, uh, and the, the sequences here are retroviral, but they're completely mutated and uh, don't express retroviruses. So some of them uh, do make reverse transcriptase. There's one particular line element in human called L1 that actually does make reverse transcriptase. So all of us have a very low level of RT in some of our cells. And uh, the consequence of that is that other uh, mRNAs can be converted to DNA copies. So for example, the signs are another kind of retro sequence. You can see duplicated sequences at either end suggesting integration by RNA-SH, uh, but these seem to don't have very much uh, 
uh, retrovirus homology. They certainly have no RT and no glycoproteins, no structural proteins. And these are probably propagated around the genome by the reverse transcriptase that we have. So think about it. Our cells are making RT. Any mRNA in the cell can be copied into a DNA, and then it can hop around and integrate in various places. And that's what happens here. These processed pseudogenes are simply DNA copies of mRNAs that we produce, which are copied into DNA by reverse transcriptase, and then they integrate at various parts in our genome. Some of these integrations have pathogenic consequences. There are some human diseases which have been mapped to integrations of, of some of these uh, retro elements. <clears throat> I'm showing you one of our endogenous uh, retroviruses called HERV-K. So 8% of our genome is endogenous retroviruses. As I said, all of them are dead, which means they're full of mutations, so they can't make virus. But uh, back in 2007, a group at the Rockefeller took the sequence of one of these endogenous retroviruses called HERV-K. And this is the closest to a uh, viable virus that is in our genome. Now that our genome is sequenced, we know the sequence of all these endogenous retroviruses. And they repaired them. They repaired all the mutations, and they got now these particles coming out of cells in culture. So they took the sequence from the human genome, they fixed the mutations in this particular HERV-K endogenous retrovirus, and they got virus out, as you can see here. So this is a virus, HERV-K, that probably infected our ancestors around a million years ago. So here is the speciation of, of Homo sapiens and its ancestors. So a million years would be about right here. So apparently here, HERV-K infected us, became endogenized, and eventually mutated, so it no longer produced virions. So what they have done is resuscitate this virus. So this is a million-year-old retrovirus back to life, a phoenix, if you will. Who knows what it could do, right? We have one retroviral gene in us, in fact, in all mammals that give rise to live birth, which seems to make a protein. And that is called syncytion. Now, what's shown here is when you get infected with a retrovirus, you know, you can, you can make viruses and transmit them to other people by the conventional routes, but sometimes they get integrated into your germline, and then you pass them on to your offspring. That's vertical transmission. So this happened millions of years ago to our ancestors, and <clears throat> most of the genes mutated, so viruses weren't produced. But apparently, the glycoprotein gene of our, one of our uh, endogenous retroviruses has been maintained as an open reading frame for all these years. So you don't maintain an open reading frame without mutations unless the protein is doing something. And what we think is this is doing is that this syncytion is what it's called now, it used to be called the viral glycoprotein, was captured millions of years ago and it enabled animals to start producing live offspring because it gave rise to a placenta. So up until that point in evolution, uh, animals couldn't have offspring developing in them because they would be rejected by the immune system. Uh, the syncytion allowed fusion to occur in the, uh, placenta, in the formation of a placenta which could separate the mother from fetus. So in every animal you look at, you see evidence for intact syncytion genes, which again are retroviral derived. They're derived from the viral glycoprotein. And just like the viral envelope glycoprotein, when it binds a receptor, can lead to fusion of the virus and the cell. We think that the expression of syncytion, which again used to be an envelope like a protein, allows cell to cell fusion, and that's how you make a placenta. So again, the, the idea is, millions of years ago, animals were infected with this retrovirus, they captured the glycoprotein gene, and its expression in the right place allowed the formation of a placenta. So you can imagine that's why it is still expressed today. Now, we, we, don't, we can't prove this in humans. I mean, syncytions are expressed in the placenta, but in mice, you can knock out the gene encoding syncytia, syncytion, and those mice do not have placentas. They don't develop properly and they can't have offspring. So good evidence that, in fact, the captured retroviral gene was actually good for us. Now, it turns out that uh, in Australia, the koalas are being endogenized by a retrovirus. So we were endogenized millions of years ago by a retrovirus, by many retroviruses. That's why we have 8% of our genome as retroviruses, but they're not making viruses anymore. Koalas right now are being endogenized. They're being infected in the virus. It's called the koala retrovirus is going into their germline. And you may know that, of course, the koala originates 
in Australia. And the infection has been going from the north to the south of Australia. People are studying this. All the koalas in the north are, are infected with this retrovirus. There's, there are some in the south that are not yet infected, but it's being spread. And eventually, they're all going to have this retrovirus. It does cause disease in koalas. It immunosuppresses them, and it makes them quite sick. So it may end up wiping them out. But in this particular study, they went into a museum where they had collected koala pelts from the 1800s. And um, they showed by PCR that back then, these animals were already infected with this retrovirus. So it spread very slowly uh, through Australia. So the reason this is cool is because we can watch endogenization in process. Most of the animals that have endogenous retroviruses, that happened millions of years ago. But now it's happening in contemporary time, and we can watch it spread through a population. All right, the last virus I want to talk about is, is hepatitis B. Uh, which is an envelope virus. It has a core, an icosahedral core, that contains this unusual double-stranded DNA genome. Remember, it's gapped. It has a protein stuck on it and a piece of RNA. And today we're going to find out why it's such a weird genome. <clears throat> this virus encodes a reverse transcriptase. When it infects cells, binds to a receptor, the core gets into the cytoplasm, and then the viral DNA goes in the nucleus, where it's repaired. It's made fully double-stranded. The RNA and the protein are taken off. This is probably done by host cell repair enzymes. Now in the nucleus, it's a double-stranded, covalently closed circular DNA. It can be transcribed by host polymerase II. And there you make genomes, uh, you make mRNAs, and these are exported in the cytoplasm, which give rise to viral proteins. One of the proteins that's made is a reverse transcriptase. And it takes the full length uh, mRNAs, which are called pregenome, it encapsidates them, <clears throat> and these uh, subviral capsids have a reverse transcriptase in them. It now makes a double stranded DNA within the capsid. So you could look at this as a retrovirus which can't wait to get out of the cell to start doing reverse transcription. That's what's happening. Because right here, it's packaged an RNA genome, right? with a reverse transcriptase. And a retrovirus would then be thrown from the cell and wait to reverse transcribe until the next cell. But hep B starts to reverse transcribe right away so that the DNA, the particles that are released, have DNA in them instead of RNA. Note, there's no integration in this life cycle. Right? The virus gets in, this, this DNA remains episomal, mRNAs are made, and new DNAs are immediately packaged. So this is all done by reverse transcriptase. And as you might guess, it's got a similar priming strategy as retroviruses, except the hep B don't use tRNAs as primers. They use, double st they use uh, stem loop structures within the genome to prime their reverse transcription. So here is the pre-genome RNA. So this is one of the mRNAs made by transcription of the DNA in the host cell nucleus. This has these interesting structures, which are going to be primers uh, for reverse transcription. Now we start on the upper left. This is the viral pre-RNA. Remember, this is in this, first it's in the cytoplasm. Then it, goes, it gets packaged into a subviral particle along with reverse transcriptase. And then the RT starts to copy it. And what it does is uses a primer uh, that is attached to the reverse transcriptase. So reverse transcriptase is called P. It has a little piece of, of uh, DNA on it that serves as a primer. And it hybridizes to the RNA up here in this DR1 region. So you can see this is slightly reminiscent of reverse transcription in retroviruses. You're doing a template jump right there. Uh, the virus then the polymerase, again, P is the reverse transcriptase. It's making uh, a DNA copy of the genome. As it goes along, it digests away so that you end up with a, a uh, minus strand DNA copy of the plus strand pre-genome RNA. Remember, this is happening in virions. Okay, so again, priming across the strands by this reverse transcriptase bound to this structure, extension all the way around. <clears throat> and that brings us here. And then there's a primer on the other strand, which was this piece of RNA never left. Uh, and this will jump strands from DR1 to DR2 and begin copying to the P protein, to the reverse transcriptase, and then it goes beyond that. 
it gets to this point, which you can see is a single negative strand with a partial uh, positive strand DNA copy. This DNA, the plus strand, only went from this primer to the end here and didn't go very far. And that gives you this uh, DNA, which is in the virion. It's gapped. You can see why it's never completely double-stranded. It's got a protein attached. That protein is the reverse transcriptase. And it's got the primer left on. That's what that primer is right here. Never got rid of it. And we don't know why this is. I think that in the virion, the enzyme runs out of triphosphates because eventually the membrane excludes triphosphates. And so it can't complete the double strand. So you end up with a partially uh, double-stranded molecule, which will get repaired when it goes into the next cell. Okay, so what, what's the story with Hep B and retroviruses? Well, it turns out there are other viruses very much like these that help to fill the gaps. So here's hepatitis B virus, and on this picture, what I've boxed is the genome that's in the virion. So the hep hepatinoviruses, hepatitis B, they reverse transcribe a pre-genome RNA which is originally packaged, remember, but what's ending up in the virion is DNA because the reverse transcriptase acts in the particle before it's released from the cell. It turns out that there are plant viruses that do the same thing as hepatitis B virus. They start as a pre-genome RNA made by transcription. You get a double-stranded DNA uh, eventually packaged. So two examples of this odd hep B reverse transcription strategy. Now here on the lower right we have our retroviruses. They package, of course, RNA. And when this RNA comes in the cell, then it's made into DNA, and that integrates. So that's very different from the, the hepadenas and the colimo viruses, in that these retroviruses, their genomes, integrate into the host cell. So, so far we have two differences. One, where the reverse transcription occurs. Remember, the hepadena reverse transcription occurs in the particle before it leaves the cell. The retroviruses, the reverse transcription occurs after the particle has infected a new cell. The second difference, the hepadenas and the colomoviruses uh, do not integrate, whereas the retroviruses do. There is another funny group of retroviruses called foamy retroviruses. They, for all intents and purposes, look like a retrovirus. They have an RNA genome, but, and they have a reverse transcriptase, they integrate a DNA copy in the, in the cell as a provirus, but the foamy viruses package DNA. And they do so because they're just like Hep B. As soon as they are assembled in a newly infected cell, you put RNA in the particle, they reverse transcribe it immediately, just like Hep B does. So they're not like retroviruses because they reverse transcribe before the particles leave uh, the cell. So we think these are all evolutionarily uh, related in some way. Perhaps the uh, retroviruses and the foamy retroviruses were very old. Maybe the retroviruses are the most ancient. The foamy retroviruses represents a progression to a DNA world and maybe the uh, hepatinoviruses and the coliomoviruses are more recent. Last thing I want to tell you. Now you know, I told you before, we all have reverse transcriptase in us. A very small amount of reverse transcriptase enzyme. Turns out that this has been active for many, many years in many, many different kinds of animals. When we sequenced the genome, what we found, not only that 8% of our genome is retroviral, you know, 20% line elements, but there were integrated pieces of other viruses which should never have been there. Uh, Rio viruses, influenza viruses, VSV, rabies virus, yellow fever virus, measles, Hepadenovirus is not supposed to be there. It doesn't integrate as part of its life cycle. Parvoviruses, circoviruses. These are small pieces of these genomes, not complete pieces, and certainly not part of the life cycle of these viruses. These got there because our cells make a little RT. And if there's a viral RNA that happens to get into the nucleus by mistake, it gets reverse transcribed and it will integrate. You can date the, the time of these integrations most of them happened hundreds of millions of years ago in various animal species. So they seem to be accidents, yet they're still there. And the question is whether they're doing anything. I gave you an example of how a retroviral gene is still doing something after millions of years. Maybe these are as well. But I want to emphasize that 
these integrations, we call them unexpected endogenous viruses, because they're in the germline. They're not in somatic cells, so they're passed on to offspring. They're not part of the viral life cycle. As far as we know, none of these viruses need integration in order to replicate. Only the retroviruses need to do that. Yes? Do we know how that occurs without the LPRs and without integrators? Well, um, it's probably a random integration event, and DNA can do that once it's in the nucleus, yeah. All right, thank you.